Welcome to The Art Box, recorded in our beautiful Mesquite, Nevada, and sponsored by the Virgin Valley Artists Association. Our association provides creative opportunities for all ages. Get creative with us at the Mesquite Fine Arts Center, 15 West Mesquite Boulevard, or find us online at mesquitefineartscenter.com or on Facebook, The Art Box. Today, I am extremely excited to interview Fred Bell, whose paths have, we've crossed. So A few times. We're, we're both kind of in the conservation movement around Southern Nevada, yet we've never met. And there he is, but I've seen his picture, so I, I knew when he came into the STEAM Center today. So, Fred, you, um, you just won an award for a film. I think you won for um, Best Nevada Filmmaker. Yeah, the Damn Short Film Festival in Boulder City. They have a number of categories, and these are all short films. Uh, I think under 40 minutes and under is the is the time limit. So they'll have categories for best drama, best comedy, best documentary, and then they have a special kind of carve out for best Nevada filmmaker. I guess they thought my film was. Oh, congratulations! All the ones and I wish I could have been there. Oh, thank you, thank you. It was, uh, I, you know, you you submit to these things and you're just happy to get in, and you never even think about the fact that maybe your film might win something. So yeah, that's fantastic. It's quite a surprise. And then I got you to drive all the way to Mesquite. So a famous person driving all the way to Mesquite. <laughs> well, I ganged it up with uh, a, a project that I'm working on. Have you ever heard of the Black Mountain Institute? No. Okay, it's a, a literary organization associated with UNLV. They are doing a project in May. It's, it's a live performance kind of thing at the West Las Vegas Library on a Sunday afternoon, May 18th, I think it's the day. And there's going to be music and dance and poetry. Somebody contacted me through a mutual, mutual acquaintance about making a soundtrack. The, the theme of the evening, uh, the afternoon, is water. And they said, I, I hear you make recordings of nature and i said yeah he said do you have any recordings of water and i said well maybe a few and they said asked me if i could put together a series of water sounds and so i came up with this idea of tracing um the sound of water because in southern nevada what the water authority tells us is that for every 10 drops of water that we use nine come from somewhere else so i thought about the sonic journey of a drop from Utah to our faucet and back to the lake. And it's called uh, Cycle, Recycle, The Journey of a Drop. Oh, great. So I got recordings of snow melting. I got waterfall sounds in Zion National Park. Uh, I was up here this morning making some more recordings of the Virgin River. Um, I have some recordings of Lake Mead. I have recordings of drains and washing machines and uh, showers and toilets and all this kind of stuff too so this whole journey of the drop from the snow melt time to discharge back to the lake time so are you, are you going to take it from the lake to um where it dries up somewhere and uh i won't go that far it'll go yeah, that far no i won't go that far yeah, so that's it's really just going to be the human use yeah so i have sounds um one of the things that really surprised me was the sounds of snow melt John Muir, the famous naturalist from um, California in the 19th century, had a comment in one of his diaries, uh, listening to the snow melting into the sound of music. So I have this. Where did you get this at? Uh, I got it in Utah. 
uh, yeah, at, at up, Zion. Yeah, way up in the Highlands area. You know, there was a lot of snow last year. I started to make started this project a year ago, and uh, um, and it got delayed for a year, but it's finally on now. And uh, so, yeah, I just got the microphones down really close and. Uh, didn't always sound this way, but I found one patch that said, I think this is what John Muir is thinking about when he says the snow is melting into music. Yeah, that's great. I, 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 I just I love the theme here. So, and of course, if we go further, it would have come down as snow and that would have been very quiet. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I could have recorded any of yeah. that. <laughs> but it still did. <laughs> so, and we can still imagine that. Yeah. Water sounds have... Just a huge variety. One of the water sounds that I got was at um, Beaver Dam State Park, which is one of my favorite places. The stream there runs kind of uh, uh, through the canyon, and it's the elevation change is not too much, so the stream level is not real steep, okay? So you don't get a lot of wild rushing sounds. Here's the sounds of a streamer recorded at the Beaver Dam State Park, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but... And if you're listening out there in podcast land, I really would encourage you to use some headphones or earbuds, something that's going to really give you a good quality sound uh, because you really hear the, the, whole, the whole experience. But if you listen, what was interesting to me about it is if you listen carefully, there has this kind of bass note going on, this sort of thump, thump. And I thought it was, I thought it was an interesting sound. Uh, it reminded me of um, conga drums, in a way, and I'm just, I'm not a, a um, arche- uh, anthropologist, but, you know, speculating thought here is maybe way back when our ancestors heard that, heard a, a, a stick beating on a hollow drum and put the two together, yeah. you know, the rhythm of the water, the beating of the drums. So. Well, they may have heard the rhythm of the water first and then tried to... Uh... Yeah, try to emulate that, you know, because it it definitely has a certain rhythm to it, you know, and uh, that's what caught my attention about that track. Not a lot of water comes through Beaver Dam. Well, in a desert sense, it does. Yeah, I guess in a desert sense. (laughs) Sometimes, actually, a lot of water comes through there. Um, I don't know if you know that park or not. It's outside of Caliente. Uh, If you drive about 26, 27 miles down this dirt road, you'll get to this little state park. It's a beautiful little park. It was real popular back in the day because there was a lake there and people would go fishing. In fact, that's the first time I ever went there was the purpose of uh, camping and fishing at the lake. Well, that canyon's prone to flooding severely, maybe every decade or something like that. And finally, a flood came through maybe 10, 12 years ago. It was bad enough that it wiped the dam out ruin the you know the lake's gone now not a lot of people go out there i hadn't been out there in years and when i got into making these um natural sound recordings one of the thoughts i had was well all these places that i used to go to camping and fishing and hiking and stuff i've been an outdoor person my whole life what does it sound like now what if i go back as a listener and so that's that's what i did kind of an interesting story. I have a memory of hiking through a beautiful little bottomland forest with a stream on the side down to the lake. Maybe it's a half mile long hike, something like that. And I thought, oh, I bet you that's a beautiful place for uh, birds. And, you know, I just remember it being a very serene, beautiful hike. So when I visited the park for the first time in quite a long time, the flood had wiped out a lot of stuff. You know, the trail was gone. Most of the forest was dead now. The lake was gone. I was kind of disappointed. I thought, well, oh, darn, that, that's, that memory's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. But I traveled all that way and decided, you know, I'll give it a shot anyway. So I got up the next morning, found a way to the path, and 
to the lake, to the um, the old lake site, and like I said, the forest was quite a bit of it was dead. And uh, I thought, well, all right, let's try anyway. And I set up my gear, and then this big gust of wind started blowing through. You know, it was getting that time of the morning where it was getting really windy. And there were still a number of dead standing trees and all that. And they all started waving in the wind, and you hear this creaking sound, like an old wooden uh, you know, sailing ship from the 17, 1800s or something like that. And it was just amazing. Put my microphones next to a tree that was really giving me some good creaks. <laughs> you had to, you know, you had to, you, you walk around with your ears, you know, yeah. uh, hike with your ears is what I like to say. So that's where, you know, where is it, what, if I put my microphones here, what's it going to sound like? Oh, yeah, I love that. The old trees. Yeah. They, they've got something yet to give. You're, you're right. Yeah, good point. They're not, you know. Just like my knees. <laughs> Mine too, unfortunately. <laughs> That's good. You know, one of my favorite places, and I've tried to do sound there, obviously not yours, but um, the Pando Forest. You know where that is in, in Utah. I, yeah, I heard your podcast about yeah, the, the interview the, with that guy. Yeah, the clones, and I like to go there. Yeah. And, and I like to go there when um, there's a breeze going because, and my wife just loves, she loves the aspen leaves, but I get the sounds of the aspen leaves. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the sounds I haven't recorded as well as I like to yet, and that's kind of on my, my bucket list of sound recordings is a really good aspen forest. I do have a sound of the Beaver Dam State Park of the trees creaking. There's another uh, a guy I read about who likes to go out and blindfold himself. Oh. And I've tried that a couple of times, actually. And it takes concentration to keep your eyes closed. So if you're blindfolded, you, you can, like, really relax and let your hearing sense be take over, you know, your primary senses. Yeah, and, and not, well, not changing the subject at all, but it would bring in people who are visually impaired. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, do, since you do this, do you hear from anybody from the visually impaired community that might say, you know, Fred, you know, thank you, because this is my art. You're recording my art. Yeah, I haven't yet, but maybe somebody's listening to the podcast and will reach out, you know, send them my note. But the visually impaired there, yeah. they have a sense that maybe you might be the closest one attuned to their sense. I, I don't think my hearing's any better than anybody else's. I just maybe think about it a little more. Yes, you, you focus in on it a little bit more. Yeah. So, never, Fred, what, what did you, growing up, uh, what did you do? When, little Fred. I played in the woods. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Did yeah. you hear the creaking then, or you were just too busy playing? I, you did not pay attention to any of that. Okay. You know, like I said in my little my film, uh, Sounds of the Blue Spaces, by the way, is the title of it, that uh, won uh, the award recently. I'd been an outdoor person all my life. I never really thought about listening to sounds. I mean, I heard, 
But um, I, I like this quote from a French essayist um, philosopher named Roland Barthes. And he said, hearing is a physiological phenomenon where listening is a psychological act. Your ears are always working, but to listen means that you're paying attention to something. And I never had until I think, well, there was an article in the paper that came out 2007, something like that. And it was about a guy in Washington State who lived out on the Olympic Peninsula, and his name was Gordon Hempton. He had established an Olympic National Park there out on the peninsula, a little personal monument that he called One Square Inch of Silence, which is kind of a catchy marketing thing. One square inch of silence, what do you mean? He said, well, he um, placed a little red stone on a log at a particular place in the Ho River uh, rainforest. He vowed to protect that one square inch from all noise intrusions, which means you're protecting a few hundred square miles, right? You can't just focus on it. So, But it's kind of a catchy thing. And and the thought of it to, the, that I realized was like, wow, wait a minute. You mean I can go someplace and maybe have some kind of assurances that I would just hear the natural sounds, you know, especially in a beautiful place like the Olympic Peninsula. And so it caught my attention. And, of course, with the Internet now, you can learn about anything. I looked him up and found that he has a book titled One Square Inch of Silence. But also he had a number of recordings on iTunes that he had made that he made available. And I downloaded a bunch of them and listened to them for a couple of years. And they're really good. He is phenomenal at this practice. He has really good equipment, which makes good equipment makes a big difference, but knowing where to go and when to go and having the time to go makes a big difference too. So I listened to his recordings. I'll never forget the first one I listened to was about the Merced River that runs from the Sierras down through Yosemite National Park. And so he followed the same path of the Merced. There was one point where he'd set the microphones up and squirrels were dropping pine cones all in the trees all around. And I'm listening there with my headphones on. I'm relaxed on the couch and all that. And I hear this one pine cone coming down, and I involuntarily ducked. <laughs> I thought it was going to hit me. I really did, you know. <laughs> that's, that's the clarity of, of his yeah. work. It's amazing. He has one of those um, Neumann mannequin heads. It's, it looks like a mannequin head. It has ears. It has microphones built in. It has a lot of electronics built into it, too. It's like a $10,000 microphone. He uses that. I have a poor man's version <laughs> of that. This is called a stereo ambient sampling system, a DIY version of it. But Crown Microphones, Crown has been a microphone manufacturer for a number of years. They have a professional version of it. But a lot of people have come up with their own designs. I found this design on, on the Internet, and I'm one of those guys that in my garage there's enough room for my wife's car, and then the rest of it is wood shop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it wasn't That would real, have been my dad's garage. Yeah, it wasn't real hard to build. So what it is is there's two microphones, you see here and here, and then there's this nose piece that sticks out from them, and what it emulates is the human profile okay a little bit and the idea is that just like our hearing if we hear sounds coming from our left side to as an example the sound will hit our left ear first but there's going to be a slight delay and a little bit of uh, roll off in high frequency and a little bit of volume change before it hits our right ear and that's how we tell all oh, the sounds coming from the left side, okay, because we have that slight delay. And so this foam creates that delay a little bit. So the, the spatial stereo imaging of the microphone setup is really accurate. I mean, if there's a sound over there, you hear it clearly on your headphones. Oh, it's a sound over on the left. And it was pretty fun sometimes as I'll get birds that will drop close by on one side and then they'll fly across you know the sound field and, and you, you can hear it. you hear that hear yeah it. that's kind of fun so then you can visualize it moving yeah. across your field of view yeah yeah if you've had sight your whole life or I, yeah i guess so or imagine it one or the other yeah so anyway back to gordon hempton and his recordings you know he had some desert recordings i think he'd made some recordings at moab but i i couldn't really find a whole lot 
Mojave, Great Basin centric kind right. of stuff. I've worked in video, audio production my whole professional life, and I thought, well, why don't I give it a try? So I learned very quick. That, uh, how old were you? Oh, this is 12, 13 years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, so late in life, kind of. Well, you're still a youngster. Uh, <laughs> I fake it. <laughs> So I got a, I got an audio recorder, you know, one of these handheld things, and it has its purpose. It's good for one thing, but the thing about nature recording is it tests the very limits of your equipment because the bird is never loud enough for you. The birds are never close enough. Rarely have I been out making recordings and I've had to turn the um, volume down. You know, <laughs> it's all it's always the case that I'm turning it up as much as I possibly can. What makes a difference between good equipment and not so good equipment, or at least for my purposes, is that all electronics have what we call, a, in, in the audio world, have a self-noise. It's that hissy kind of sound that you, if you start tear, turning things up too loud, you kind of hit that, that grainy sort of hiss. And so all electronics will do that. You know, you're a photographer, right? So, you know, if you start bumping up the ISO too much on your on your cameras, you start getting that noise. Well, this is the audio equivalent okay. of that, that hissy kind of sound, which is not what you want. You know, you want a nice, clean, noiseless sound. So the better equipment will have better design, better components and all that. So I realized that the little handheld recorder was not then the microphones that was built into it. That was not going to work. Found some better stuff. And it was pretty good as long as the volumes were reasonable. I made some recordings at one of my favorite places. Another one is Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. About halfway between uh, Pahrump and Death Valley National Park. Yeah. And it's a big... Uh, oasis area full of springs full of ponds it's one of the few places that i know of i can get open water and hear and marsh sounds and things like that and make some pretty good recordings there i'll play you a sample yeah we love ash meadows Peterson Pond is like the medium-sized body of water out there, and uh, there's lots of cattails around and stuff like that. And the, I've made recordings all year, you know, uh, springtime, fall, winter, and it's always different. You know, the different seasons all have their own particular kind of sound. This is a recording in the springtime when the yellow-headed blackbirds okay. are um, there getting ready to nest and, and all that. and. Uh, you really hear them going back and forth, and you can hear some bitterns and some um, coots, and just uh, there's just a a riot of bird song going on out there. One of the sounds that I got was a, um, and I didn't bring this one with me, sorry, but there was a particular there was a bird that sat actually pretty close to me and just sang and sang and sang, and I didn't know what it was at the time. I was a very poor birder, and I'm still not great at it but i've learned an awful lot since then i got a recording of it and then i took it i stopped at the visitor center 
And it just so happens that there was a volunteer there that was doing bird surveys, a, a bona fide ornithologist. And I had her listen to it, and she said, oh, that's a Bullock's Oriole. That's a, that's a nice recording you got there. And I said, yeah, thank you. And the uh, manager for the visitor center was there, too. And she said, oh, let me hear, let me hear. And so I played it for her. I played the um, also the Peterson Pond sound that you just heard as well. And I could see the little light bulb go off in her head because at the time, this was 14 years ago, something like that. The visitor center at Ash Meadows was a trailer. And she said, you know, we're in the process of designing a new one and going to have it built in maybe a year and a half or so. Maybe we could do something. I wound up making a CD uh, that they... Um, yeah, they I, think, I think we sold that CD there. Oh, it, it may have. Yeah, um, I think. Yeah, it, it was the only one of Sounds of Nash Meadows. Yeah, no, I, I probably sold a couple of hundred through there. Yeah, I don't know. I asked my wife; she would remember because she worked at the visitor center. Oh, really? I, and I gave it all back as a, a as a donation. You know, well, they insisted on sending me a buck for each one to cover my cost, but I think they sold them for seven or eight dollars, and so five or six of it stayed there on the on the refuge. So I was happy to do it. Yeah, that was nice. But when I got asked to do that that project to make recordings, I said, "Well, if this is going to be something that's going to be." sold you know it needs to be professional level so then i went out and got the equipment that i have now not the very best but pretty good pretty good stuff um to get the very best is another two or three thousand dollar expenditure <laughs> and i have my limits yeah <laughs> i know my wife doesn't believe it but believe me <laughs> i do i have my, i have my limits of what i'll spend on this stuff it's a hobby but but yeah, yeah but it's more than a hobby it's become a passion. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, something I believe in. One of the things I realized is, is that quiet places are really hard to find. And when I say quiet, I mean, like, I can set up my equipment and I don't hear anything except the natural sounds that are supposed to be there. It's a real challenge. Like, I want to get away from urban sounds. I want to get away from road sounds. I try my best to get away from jet traffic sounds. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I'm a night sky photographer. A lot of my problem is light pollution, planes gift. But I, I'll go out and camp at Gold Butte, and Gold Butte's a spot because it's right on the corridor. Yeah, right. Yeah, and until 2 in the morning, and this is me shooting the Milky Way, too. Until yeah. 2 in the morning, I've got, you know, going back and Streaks. forth. Streaks. And I've given up trying to remove them. That's just they're, they're there. But yeah. it's also the sound. Yeah. The sound bothers me. I I actually have never tried to make recordings out there because um because of that. There's there's three criteria that I try to follow. Not strictly, but you know, if there's when I'm looking for a new place there's one, is there some kind of greenery there? Uh meaning there's there's a water source. Maybe it's an underground spring or something you don't see, but is there something that's gonna attract wildlife there? You know, there's sounds out in the wide open desert in the in the creosote bush and all that, but that's really hard. It's real hit and miss. And so, so I look off. You know, first off, I look is it some some kind of greenery, and then is there a road nearby, like within five miles? And if there is, and if it's a, it's a highway or something, no. Nah. Corn Creek Station at Desert Wild at um, Desert Wildlife Refuge there in, out north of Las Vegas. You can and hear 95? I hear 95, especially when the trucks hit the rumble strips. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, I hear, you know, and that's like four and a half, five miles away, but it's just wide open desert. So if there's a road nearby, eh, probably not. And then the last thing I do is I'll go to a um, website like Flight Radar 24 or Flight Aware, <laughs> and I look at the jet traffic patterns and uh, try to figure out how many jets are flying there, what time of the day most, you know, what, what's the quietest time of day. I, I usually try to want to re make recordings in the morning. Uh, the dawn chorus is the best time of day to, um, to make natural sound recordings. Uh, the, the birds are most active. It's sunrise. Yeah, right. It starts actually about maybe a half hour before it's even light enough to see. And then it continues on for a couple more. I mean... You hear birds throughout the day, don't get me wrong on that, but you'll hear the most intense portion of it the first couple of hours of the morning. 
one of the places I really I've made some recordings there and I've really tried to make more but it's tough is Great Basin National Park which is a shame because it's a state it's Nevada's only national park and directly over the park is like a major interstate highway of plane traffic yeah. I mean it's just from about 7 o'clock on till 10 o'clock at night it's one every 10 minutes and the sensitivity of my equipment, I can hear a jet for anywhere from five to eight minutes. Can you really? Yeah, a long time. A long time I can hear them coming. It depends on if they're, uh, if they're departing, if they're arriving jets, they're a little quieter. If they're departing jets, they're way louder So because they've got more engine thrust going on. So I, I can make a recording there for like an hour, hour and a half there in the morning, but, but after that, it's, it's just about impossible. Park Service has done a lot of surveys, and I've even participated as a as a um, as being surveyed. You know, what's the most important thing about? Oh, the quiet. I want I want quiet when I'm out here. It's the world we live in. This industrial world of these jets flying around. It's you know, <laughs> I've and taken plenty of my share of plane rides too. Do you remember the first time you came out to the desert and you heard that silence? We had moved to Colorado. And I took my son out whitewater rafting when we camped in Pike National Forest. And nature called for me about 3 a.m. And I unzipped the tent. And you hear people say, well, I, I, I cooked my breath, took my breath away. It took my breath away when I looked up and saw that. But the other, the other thing besides seeing the, the Milky Way for the first time was hearing coyotes out there really for the first time. And it was quiet except for the coyotes and it was beautiful yeah yeah they are the quintessential sound of the western i'm not religious at all but that was religious experience i seen the milky way and the coyotes yeah i totally get that yeah Yeah. i have a great recording of the coyotes that i made at death valley national park that's uh, if you go to my website it's one of the feature things down there and it explains something about some technical stuff about sound waves and stuff like that oh, okay. but, but I like the coyote sound You know, it's the quintessential sound of the American Southwest, you know, yeah. is to, you know, hearing those. They're not the easiest animals to make recordings of, you would think. Uh, I've never have been in a place where I heard them, like, all night long. Uh, oh, no, just, yeah, just a little bit. Just maybe a couple of minutes or so. Yeah. And it, it seems like different locations will have different schedules, so to speak. Like this was made at like 11 o'clock at night at Death Valley. I made some recordings of coyotes at Ash Meadows. The only time I ever heard them was around seven or eight in the morning, well after sunrise. Yeah, you're right, I yeah. I can remember being out there, yeah. Yeah. Because we would hear them from our trailer. Yeah. So, and um, other places I've heard them, you know, maybe Seven o'clock in the evening, maybe an hour after sunset, something like that. The yeah, Mojave National Preserve, I've heard of more, maybe a couple hours after sunset. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but, it, you know, I, I do know that when I'm trying to make recordings of coyotes, that I usually have to go and spend a day and say, okay, what time are they, what time of this is this pack start singing? Okay, 8 o'clock at night. All right, so I'll start my recorder up at 7 o'clock at night and let it run for several hours because, you know, it won't be right at 8 o'clock. Right. <laughs> They're not that tight of a schedule. But, you know, I said, well, my better chances are starting from this time period, you know. Whereas go to another place, okay, they're in the morning. All right, okay. I'll up in the morning and I'll start the recorder. And uh, Yeah, but are you ever laying there sleeping? You, you want to start your recorder in the morning? 
but then they do it at midnight? Oh, yeah, I've had, sure. Yeah. And you have to run out of the tent? And... <laughs> yeah. No, sometimes I've had inconsistencies, you know. So, But they're, they're just a great, great sound. I love listening to that. Never get tired of it. Now, when we first moved out, it was a little bit scary being in Pike National Forest and hearing that. Yeah. So, and I'm thinking, oh, what do we do? Yeah. Well, we'd probably just enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. So just enjoy it because they're not they're not going to bother you. No. Yeah. I, I do have a funny story. The reason I brought the microphone and set this up was I was making a recordings at the um, Amargosa River Canyon. That's that stretch. It's actually dedicated wild and scenic river between uh, Dakota and uh, the China Ranch Date Farm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was there early morning setting up below um, the China Ranch State Farm, and I'm on a, so what goes through the canyon is an old railroad bed, right? So I'm up on a cut through the railroad bed, and the stream, uh, the river, it's you have to change your definition of a river when you talk about yeah. rivers. <laughs> it's down below, down a steep little bank, and then across, and, and I'm Sitting and recording, my my microphone is set up on this tripod right at the edge of the bluff because I wanted to get the stream sound and the, the mesquite trees and all that. They're all like right right below me. And, and I'm sitting there and, and I sit about 25 feet away from the microphone. You can't sit close because stomach gurgles. Well, I'm sure, yeah. All that kind of stuff it gets picked up, you know, if I'm close at all. I see a flash of something and, and instead of thinking, oh, it must have been a rabbit, I thought, God, was that a bobcat? Huh, interesting. Well, I don't know. I couldn't see it well enough, but it, something made me think it was a bobcat. Well, so I'm sitting on this mound here, and about 15 minutes later, here comes a bobcat, a little bobcat. He's a juvenile. He's about maybe a foot tall, foot and a half, something like that. And he's about 40 feet away from me, and he's coming around the base of the mound, and he's got that, I own a cat, so I know that, that, uh, uh, that, pattern that they have you know they're stalking something and i thought oh this is going to be great he's stalking something i might get something fantastic you know well i never see him again but i uh, maybe five minutes later i hear all this rock sliding now what in the world and i don't hear anything else and then maybe 30 seconds later i hear more rock sliding and it occurred to me this is what he's stalking Oh. He's stalking my microphone. Okay, this microphone is covered with fake fur. Yeah. All right. You, you do that because the the fur protects you from the wind. Right. Uh, the fibers, the loose fibers, they absorb the energy of the wind. So to him, it's a bunny on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> Did he knock it over? No, I never saw him. And what was amazing is I never, heard, except for the rock sliding. I never heard him. I mean, he must have gotten pretty close, right? But I was sitting back, and the, the microphone's at the edge of the bluff there. And uh, so I couldn't really see down past the microphones and all that, on, you know, down the downslope of the, of the bluff there a little bit. Yeah, I mean, these things are really – what amazed me was um, I had a reporter, Henry Breen, who was an environmental reporter with a review journal years ago, did a, a story on me feature story in fact it was on the front page and above the fold with a picture above the fold <laughs> above the fold even. You, you are famous Fred. <laughs> this was uh 12 years ago something like that and he won an award for it too yeah uh but anyway i took him out one morning to uh, um you know show him what i do and make recordings and all that and he's sitting like 75 feet away and he has this habit of clicking his ballpoint pen oh and finally, I just get his attention. I said, you have to stop that. I hear it. He said, are you kidding me? I said, yeah, I hear every bit of that. Wow. <laughs> so this bobcat that, you know, got really close to me, and I never could hear. I went back and heard that, listened to that recording later. I said, so I you, you heard the rock sliding. I heard the rock sliding. But you never heard. I never heard the bobcat at all. That's how quiet they are. It's amazing. So... So I walked out of there thinking, uh, finished my recordings and walked out of there and thinking, that's a cute little story of Bobcat stalking my microphone. It is a good story. And then this thought occurred to me that stopped me dead in my tracks and gave me a chill and said, oh, next time I'm in mountain lion country, <laughs> maybe I should 
take some precautions, you know. Because <laughs> they've been stalking you, too. Uh, maybe so. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the reason I brought that in. It was like you could kind of see the demonstration with the, with the fur and all that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, it's a bunny on a stick. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so when do you ever do you ever set it up and then go to sleep? I have set it up and yeah, I've uh, yeah, I've set it up outside my trailer, you know, uh, gone to sleep. Uh, I've set it up and walked away uh, and you know came back a couple hours later see what uh, see what uh, what I can, what I could find, what's on there. Uh, usually I'll do that because I know my presence is really gonna it, it's a very sparse area and just me being there is probably going to have a negative influence yeah so but most of the time almost all the time i could sit there with my headphones on and just be still and for an hour maybe two hours something like that you know maybe i have to get up and stretch once or twice or something but after about 10 minutes or so the, the birds will start they'll just ignore you okay you're not a threat you're not bothering anybody you'll we're cool, you know, and they'll start singing and coming around, and um, I get my recordings that way. Um, so what size are your files typically? And I, you know, I, I take one picture now, and that's 96 meg. It's you about see? like a gig an hour or something like Is it? that. Yeah, they're not huge. Uh, not like my video files at all. You know, we were talking about jet noise and all that. One of my favorite sounds that I was able to capture uh, at the um, We Thump Wilderness, it's uh, you know a Vikwa May National yeah. Monument, our newest nation's newest national monument. There's a wilderness inside that now, yeah. it's the Joshua Tree Wilderness. I was able to make recordings there. There are three, maybe four, great horn owls, like in one location. I've never heard that many owls before, and so I was really excited about this recording, but also. I made it in April of 2020, and we all know what's going on in April of 2020. The whole world is shut down. Yeah, so right? the air traffic was... Uh, no yeah. air traffic. I've gone back and tried to make that recording again, and just, it's hard. <laughs> did, did you see them ever? No, you know, I rarely see what uh, what I make recordings of, you know. That's why um, Bernie Krause, the uh, famous... Uh, one of the pioneers in soundscape recordings that, you know, uh, yeah, the picture may be worth a thousand words, people say. Well, I think my soundtrack recording's worth a thousand pictures. Yeah. Because I almost never see, I mean, sometimes you'll see, but a lot of times you don't, you know, you don't see these, uh, but you hear them. And if you hear them, you know they're there. And if you know they're there, you know, well, this is a good, this is a healthy environment. You know, Bernie Krause has this thing. Or he's um, lives in Northern California, and he's visited this state park at the same day every year for like the last 20 years or so. And he is watching the sound levels just go down, uh, and the variety, the oh, number yeah. of and all that. And he can you can look at it on the computer screen, you know, the graph of the sound wave, and go look at 2005 and look at. 2020 and go, God, what happened? He says, it's global warming as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I took my Merlin. We were camping the other night and uh, I'm down near, near near Scottsdale out a little bit. And I got up and I heard a lot of birds. So I put my Merlin app on and, you know, there was like four or five birds. So I got my camera out and yeah. sat in a chair. I didn't see one bird. <laughs> <laughs> but I kept hearing them. I know they were there. Yeah, I know. Like, come on, show yourself. Yeah. Let me get a picture of you. But I enjoyed it anyway. I'm so glad my wife got me to get the Merlin app. Oh, okay. Because now I know they're still there. I'm enjoying their sounds. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a lot of good. I still have to get the picture, mind you. Is an, would an art gallery, have they ever, and how would they do it, have an exhibition just for sounds? I haven't done where sounds were exclusive, but I have participated in three different exhibits. Two of them in, in Las Vegas area and one of them in Southern California. So the first one was curated. first one was curated by um, Checo Salgado. Okay. And it was yeah. about uh, monuments, national monuments in Southern Nevada. Okay. That was the one that was at Charleston West? Sahara West. Sahara West. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you went, th yeah, that was yeah, my I had sounds. some pictures in there. Okay. You did. Okay. Great. Yeah, there was a lot of art in there. Yeah. Yeah. And that was what, 20? 
2016, 18, 17, 18, 18, yeah, yeah, okay. But yeah, I uh, supplied sounds for that, hung some speakers in there. And then when uh, Checo and Kim Garrison Means and Michaela Whitmore put together the uh, Vico May Spirit of the Land uh, exhibit at the Barrick Museum, I had the auditoriums off to the side. I had sounds playing. In didn't that. you? Yeah. Okay, I didn't go to that, but I went to the same when they had in um, out in California. Oh, at the Orange Coast? Yeah, the Orange Coast College. Yeah, okay. And I, I forget the name of the of the gallery there, but yeah, I can't it's on, on it the either. tip of my tongue. But it's where she teaches, I yeah. think, right? And so, yeah. So yeah, I, that's where I saw that. Yeah, I gave my file, and they set up a speaker there. And okay. They said, I never got to uh, attend it, but they said it worked out really well. But there's other senses. Right. You know, most of our world is really aimed towards the visual. For most of my recording hobby, I guess I've had a full-time job, but I... I oh, yeah, we should talk about that. Because you're a youngster. You still work. A couple more years, I'll retire. Although you up, you are up here on a... I'll be 63. You are up here on a Wednesday. Yeah, well... During the week. I, yeah. I, yeah. Um, well, right now I'm back to working freelance, so my schedule is pretty open at the moment. So, but, uh, but I was working a... Um, Blue Man show for yeah for seven seen years. That. You've never seen Blue Man? Oh yeah, I have. Oh, My yeah. wife and I went. Yeah. We sat in the first couple rows and got um painted. Yeah, got, got splashed blue paint and where? when they threw the the toilet paper that comes through. Yeah, where uh, where did you see it? It wasn't that where it's at now. Not at the Luxor. No, it so wasn't at the, the Luxor. Um, Monte Carlo or the Venetian then? Maybe the Venetian. That would have been like it was, it was 14, 15 years ago. It's 2007, something like that. Yeah, okay. That would have been the Venetian, I think. Yeah. It's, I, be, it's before we moved out here. Yeah. It's a great it's a great show, great job. I, I loved it. Yeah, I really did. So, but, uh, so, Fred, in that you're a sound artist, well, you do visual too, but do you, do you ever dream about art? Dream about your work? Uh I don't guess I do. Maybe I should. And then I'll ask a smart butt question. If you dream, is it only in audio? <laughs> I don't think no, I'm ever, just joking. I, ever, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody's dreams being sound related, have they? It's always visual, isn't it? I think. Unless maybe they're singing or something like that and they see themselves singing or something. I don't know. Yeah. Do you have other interests? Woodworking. Uh, some woodworking, yeah. Photography, you know. I've taken pictures for a long time, and I um, I got into making these documentaries. Sounds of the Blue Spaces is the um, third one that I've made, and I got into making them as a way to give my recordings another avenue, uh, outlet, you know, a little more life in a different direction, because I used them for the one I made about Jim Boone. Have you seen? I've seen that. Um, foul claims and then um do you know lynn warren who used no. to live in shoshone i think he's moved back to maine most of the time now uh which is where he's from originally but he was called the Birdman of shoshone he was he's an amazing guy and um i did a, a film about him in the amargosa river a few years ago and used he has some incredible bird footage of doing just the craziest things and um so i used a lot of my sounds to pair up with that so do you have a funny story i mean besides um stalking the the hairy recording device yeah <laughs> uh the only other time i've got scared making recordings is i was recording elk bugling in the fall at great basin national park they were bu they only bugle at night so i'm out there and it's a new moon and it's overcast so it's like pitch dark you can, you know like can't see your hand in front of your face kind of dark and there's one elk that is i don't know he's a ways off half mile or something like that because of the echo and all that so this guy's way over here but there's another on a hillside maybe a quarter mile away or something like that and uh, they're going back and forth and i'm sitting there and it's like nine o'clock at night freezing cold and just pitch dark and the one on the right stops for a little bit, maybe 10 minutes or so. And then he starts up again, and it sounds like he's right next to me. He sounds like he's 100 yards away. And you don't want to be around a horny, 
<laughs> when in the rut season like that. Yeah. They don't like things in their territory, you know. And I yanked off my headphones. I said, oh, my God, he's right there. <laughs> and then he bugled again. I said, no, no, he's still on the hillside, I can tell. But I think what happened was he was turned away from me for a long time. And then he turned right towards me. And, yeah, the mics do a great job of spatial positioning and all that. But as far as distance goes, it can it can be tricky. So I thought that thing was right next to me. And then here I am in the dark and cold. And <laughs> I have another recording, though, that I'll, I'll share with you. When I was up at Great Basin, and uh, I was there for like a week and a half, and uh, a weather front blew through, and I uh, couldn't hear any birds at all. I mean, it was just roaring wind. And I thought, well, if you got wind, go record wind. So um, you, you, know, you can drive all the way up to that high campground. It wasn't open yet, but you can drive up to like 8,000 feet. And then I hiked another 1,000 feet or so up. And I found a spot kind of nestled in a little divot in the terrain a little bit. There were some trees around me, I think some high bushes, something like that. So I had a little bit of protection. And the wind that you can hear roaring across the ridge it's just incredible. It was so powerful sounding, and uh, and I was I was real happy to get a recording of that. Here it is. Yeah, I think you know, that's I think that's unique to out here in the West. I think to hear that kind that of you can hear it coming. Yeah, oh, you can hear it, and when the recording here, you can hear it blowing across the ridge from the right to the left. And there's a couple of Clark's nutcrackers that, are, and maybe some finches that are, are calling away. So um, one of the questions I get I have been asked a lot is, "Where's the quietest place I've ever been?" And oddly enough, and it's strictly because of the policy of the United States Air Force. The quietest place I've ever been is just north of Las Vegas in the sheep range of Desert Wildlife National Refuge. All that is strictly military airspace. No commercial flights, no private flights are allowed. So if you go there on a holiday, like the, the two times I've been up there in a place called Hidden Forest where there's a cabin and there's a little okay. pipe spring. Okay, I've never been there, but... It's a tough hike. It's six miles up through loose gravel up that wash. And, yeah, it's, it's, I keep telling myself every January that I get my butt back in shape enough that I can make that hike because it's an overnight trip, so you're carrying all your backpacking and my sound gear and all that. But, but it's the only place I've ever been there in the Hidden Forest where I had 24 hours of complete no industrial yeah. sounds at all. So, and it's... It's 25 miles north of Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, that's close. Yeah, yeah, but you can't. You know, if the military's not flying, then nobody else is. Nobody else can fly at all. And so, if the military's not flying, then you know it's it's really quiet because there's no roads anywhere near. And um, yeah, one of my best places to shoot the Milky Way is up by Rachel. Yeah. yeah because the Area 51, you don't have the commercial traffic. Right. Yeah, you still see that north of that, you'll know, still the overflights. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've tried to make recordings a little further at the uh, uh, Kirch Wildlife Management Area. Okay, yeah. And uh, in the marsh areas and all that. And it's, you can do it sometimes, but a lot of times you get a string of planes. You know, I can, like I said, I can hear one for five to eight minutes. <laughs> and if they're every, if they're 10 minutes apart, then I've only got two minutes of yeah. sound. It's like, Eh, it's, I can't really deal with that. That's not worth it. Yeah. 
Sometimes if it's a plane every half hour or something, okay, I can edit that out. I can still salvage a good recording. Uh, I loved Ash Meadows. I spent a lot of time recording there, but uh, I it, it was a lot of trial and error of saying, well, okay, when, when can I... I found that the best time really is like at dawn on Sunday mornings that I can get maybe an hour yeah. of quiet. And then one plane and then maybe another half hour or something like that. So, you know, not, not too bad. Uh, but uh, during the week, no, impossible. So, so you married? I am. Happily so. For Kids? I have one daughter. She lives in Tucson. She's a um, graduate at the University of Arizona okay. in cello performance. Oh, okay. Uh, she's a semi-professional cellist making her way. She's working uh she just finished um no, i think this coming weekend she will uh is playing in the pit orchestra for a um opera down there so or musical so and she does some church stuff things like that and and then also she's got a regular job too you know, gotta pay the bills <laughs> yeah that's what we ask we ask most of the artists we there's not many of them who don't have a regular job yeah it's, it's hard hard to make a living especially you're young I think you more than anybody. You probably prepare more than anybody. I, uh, I guess it does does take some preparation. Yeah, I mean, I learned. I made a lot of mistakes and didn't get recordings that I liked at all <laughs> for maybe a year and a half or so. I mean, I wasn't like out every weekend or something like that, failing. But you know, the first. Yeah, because you're married, you got to spend some time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> first, uh, my first outings, all, almost all of them were not successful. And uh, finally, okay, got to get up earlier. Uh, you want to be in this place at this time of year, that sort of thing. Uh, so, do you have a critic in your head? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, as far as. Um, yeah, I could have, uh, you know, I wished I'd spent more time out. I needed to spend more time out there. That's the biggest thing is you just got to put the time in. You know, it's hard to do. Now that I'm nearing retirement, I'm not working full time now. I can, I've got more time to spend. So. Oh, do you have a uh, a website, social media? I, ha I have a website. Um, it's called soundsandspaces.net. And you can... Um, See links to my SoundCloud files. I have a number of files on SoundCloud. Uh, you can see some of my films that I've made. Uh, not all of them have been films that I've put in festivals or anything like that. Some of them are just a little odd films and a lot of pictures that I've taken over the years. So, I have one more sound that I wanted to share. Okay. Up to now, all, all my sounds have been sounds of nature, natural sounds. Okay. I, I do my best to get away from our industrial world but there's one industrial sound that just has me totally smitten that i've started listening to a couple of years ago and that's the steam engines at the nevada northern railroad museum in ely it's a national historic landmark there's something about a steam whistle that just it's it's like a musical instrument to me and the the terrain around ely with the canyons and the mountains and all that the sound is just incredible and i've been up there a few times now making recordings in different locations around town and around the canyons of the steam engines the way steam uh, steam whistle works is that the more steam you let in the hotter the whistle gets this is my understanding anyway then the sound changes okay and that's how they get that variation in the tone a horn on a 
modern locomotive now is like digital. It's on or it's off. But the engineer in a steam engine, he can feather that sound. He can make it do different things. So that's that's hard. I, I've never tried it, but I bet it takes some practice. I was going to say. And then also, you know, how he chooses the rhythm of the sounds and all that. And I said, that's, that's, that's a musician, you know, in the sense that um, he's uh, making decisions about how he's presenting the sound of the steam engine. That's such a musician. So I have a, a file here of some of the uh, some of the recordings that I've made up there. Where were you at when you recorded these? Uh, different places around Ely. Mostly, I would say, uh, it's called uh, Robinson Canyon that's west of town. That's where the train would go up to the um, copper mines okay. that are up there. They have a, a tourist excursion train that takes you up to the mine and back. That's where most of those probably were made, I guess. But but I've made different portions around town, stuff like that. You know, But those are my favorite ones. That are, uh, that's good. Yeah, that, that museum is incredible. I mean, the, um, was it Anaconda Copper, I think, yeah. maybe something like that. They never got rid of anything. That's Apparently, that's what made that uh, National Historic Landmark is like, it's not just the engines, but all the paperwork and oh, is there all the, the paperwork? employee logs yeah. and all the purchases. They, they never got rid of any of that stuff. And then they have three uh, operating steam locomotives. They have cerebral diesel uh, locomotives. They have this uh, uh, wrecking crane that's a steam-operated wrecking crane that's just incredible to see. You know, cables and pulleys and gears and a steam engine, and, uh, and it, it works. It's an operating crane. Yeah, it's not bird songs. It's not water sounds. It's not wind sounds, but... It's not ATVs. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, it's not. It's not uh, Jets, and it's not Harleys either. Sorry, I'm going to get you some hate mail for that, probably. Yeah, it's just incredible sound. Yeah, that takes us back, the steam engine. The Ely's a gem. If you're interested in natural sounds, there's a couple of things I'd recommend. One, the National Park Service has a division called Natural Sounds and Dark Skies. They're based in Boulder, Colorado, and they have a lot of resources that you can go to their website. And then also Apple TV has a series out now called Earth Sounds that's really incredible. So if you're an Apple TV subscriber, I would, I would recommend that or hear some state-of-the-art sound recording going on. Fred Bell, thank you very much. This was so highly interesting. I don't know that... We listen to sound all day, but I don't know how many people think about it too much, and I hope they will now. Well, I hope so. Uh, get out there and hike with your ears, find yeah. a quiet place, sit and listen for a little while. Oh, there, I like that. Yeah, lay down in the forest and yeah. forest bathing. <laughs> all right, Fred, thank you for coming up. You're quite welcome. It's been an honor. Broadcasting from the Mesquite Works Steam Center in the scenic Mojave Desert, the Art Box sponsors thank you for listening. You can find us on Spotify and Amazon Music. Please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We welcome all comments. You can email us at artboxvv at gmail.com. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of its hosts and guests and do not necessarily reflect those of the Virgin Valley Artists Association.